Welcome to the SEI podcast series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcast. My name is Suzanne Miller. I am a principal researcher here at the SEI, and today I am pleased to introduce you to James Edmondson, who is basically the SEI's middleware expert and is actually one of the more recent additions to our staff. James builds middleware, particularly for distributed artificial intelligence. He specializes in real-time systems, control, and distributed algorithms. Fun stuff. Fun stuff. In today's podcast, we are going to be talking about his work on autonomous systems. Welcome, James. Thanks for having me, Suzanne. Absolutely. So let's start off by having you explain exactly what an autonomous system is. That's a sort of a big word, but we've got, I know, in the common literature, there's some other ways we talk about this, too. And as I understand it, this is also a new area of work at the SEI, at least since I've been involved with it, which is 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, what prompted the SEI to be begin research in this field? Well, uh, I'll start off with the autonomous systems, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, Autonomous systems has a lot of different definitions, and we really focus in my group on robotic systems and, and autonomous systems for robotic systems. But there's a lot of different areas with, concerning software. Uh, but essentially, I would probably define it as a computational system that performs a desired task, um, often without human guidance. Um, and there really is a scale of autonomy involved. You can have between partial autonomy and full autonomy. And we focus in the area of partial autonomy. So um, we're, we're really trying to build systems that complement human users and not try to replace them in a certain task. So they things that reduce the cognitive load on a user or that do a complex or dangerous task that might not be something you'd want to risk a human for, for example. Absolutely. Or it could just be, in, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, it could be a situation where you only have so many people in the area and you have a lot of area to cover. And so you really need to extend the reach of the human operators to give them more range within a shorter time frame than you would be able to do with that person by themselves. So that's important in a lot of different emergency responder, first responder mm -hmm. contexts, as well as military contexts. So a lot of different application for this kind of thing. Absolutely. It's a huge field. Okay. And so what, what got you started in this here at the SEI? Why the SEI to do this work? Well, um, we've, we, uh, I've really been researching this kind of area for quite some time, and one of the things that you see in literature from various agencies, uh, government agencies from DHS to FEMA to um, military, obviously, documents, is that they believe that autonomy has a large role in the future of our systems. And so um, we've really started investigating partial autonomy because we believe it is the future of software, and that really we need to start focus on these smart devices and smart software that form synergies with human operators and try to enhance what they're able to do. So really, uh, we believe that um, partial autonomous systems are the better way to go for, especially government agencies, there's a lot of pushback on having something fully autonomous. And there's a lot sure. of scary stories about, you know, we don't want to give them full control. If it's a drone, for instance, flying over skies, we don't want them to have call for fire. We don't want them to sure. have yeah. uh, the ability to do that. There needs to be a human person we that makes human that decision. Human in the loop is, is exactly. What so we about. we really we focus on partial human in loop autonomy. So that's why, and we think that is a huge part of not only government work but also for commercial work. Um, no one wants a system that has no ability for human to feed back into the system, and you always want to have uh, the ability to at least look into what it's uh, deciding and, and understand how, it's how the decisions was made and all those kinds of. You things. need a lot of forensics. I mean, yeah. for both legal reasons and also. Sure. for uh, just operational reasons, absolutely. So you work out of the Advanced Mobile Systems Initiative, which aims to help soldiers who use smartphones, emergency workers who use them when they're responding, um, roles that we call on the tactical edge here at the SEI. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see some ways that this would fit with autonomous uh, systems, and but why don't you say how you see this fitting in with the Advanced Mobile Systems Initiative? Well, I won't speak for Ed Morris, who leads the, the group, really. He's got his own focus on, on what the group should accomplish, but I, I think that um, it's key to remember that Advanced mobile systems is really about the future of mobile computing in either tactile edge environments or in any environment. Like uh, I know you guys recently talked with Somia, who talked more mm -hmm. about um, the ability to use like um, cyber forging, cloudlets, and, and the ability to do edge analytics and things of nature for not only military applications. And that's really not the focus of AMS, I would say. Um, it's really about any kind of tactical edge environment. And, and we consider that to be an environment dictated by bandwidth, by resources, whether that's human or technological. And what I mean by that is you might not have enough people to search an area, like we said earlier, um, or technological where 
like you're in a you're in the uh, middle of an earthquake kind of situation you only have one bulldozer or whatever and you need to know where should you send that to help save sure. lives i mean you could start clearing the whole area and get there after four weeks and and you know you might save some people you might not but if you can build systems that help uh, people make better decisions to triage situations when they know they have a lot of stress on the human operators they have very little time to make decisions and they have very little bandwidth to work with for communication we want to help solve problems in that area we think that autonomy is a great way to augment people and help them uh, accomplish more in less time but there's a lot of technical challenge there because autonomy also involves some fairly complex software, some very complex algorithms that may also be constrained at the edge. So how do you deal with that in, in your work? I think um, we're in the middle of a, a major shift in computing from the sequential processor and, and single tasks, single uh, computational units to accomplish something, and really looking at parallel computing. And, and granted, we've been doing parallel computing for decades, but there really isn't a focus on it. When I was at Vanderbilt, um, you, do, you weren't required to take parallel computing. You weren't required to take a lot of these high-performance computing classes. Uh, they had their base requirements, and that's how most undergraduates are taught right now is, is parallel if you want to as an elective. And for those that don't understand necessarily that particular discipline, just give a couple of words about what's different between parallel computing and sequential computing. Absolutely. Um, there's, there's, when you program for a parallel or distributed system, you really have to take into account uh, the perspectives of each agent. So you, you can't just... Um, program like uh, this variable interacts with this other variable in this way, uh, you know, kind of in a linear fashion. You have to be a little bit broader minded to understand that you have asynchronous events, you have events firing off at, at times that you're not expecting, and you have to handle those events, and somehow it has to make sense and have a cohesive kind of plan for solving that in a parallel way. And what I mean by that is um, like with, with heterogeneous cores or with uh, CPUs nowadays, you have like eight cores on them, for instance, right. with the i7. Um, if we do the kind of program we've always done, you can take advantage of one of those cores and maybe you can launch 20 applications at once and you know the eight cores will kind of uh, go between those. They'll balance it. Yeah, exactly. The, they'll do load balancing on that to have the eight cores work as best you can there. Um, but when it comes to working with like a swarm of drones like we're doing in this project, you don't have the ability for a compiler to really optimize how these things are going to work together. You can't just launch eight of the applications and hope that one of the drones does that. Um, that would be a choke point on all the communication, all the computation, everything else in the, in the thing. You really need to understand how to program in a way that harnesses all of the hardware that you have available and the interactions between them, and, and it really does make it more complex. Um, but that's part of what makes it fun. That's what makes it fun, uh, and that's why also um, we haven't made as much progress as you might think that we should and, and be in the state that we should to handle this. Uh, like we had talked about a little bit before the interview, um, you know, the FAA is going to open up our airspace in 2015 uh, for commercial aircraft, um, drones, whatever you'd like to call them. And uh, this is going to help out a lot of different industries from agriculture to um, and that is actually considered to be the largest buyer of drones. And, and when it actually the airspace is opened up for the public will be farmers who want to um, irrigate their crops or they want to spray pesticides in a way that doesn't require them to keep hiring a pilot to have sure. one plane that goes with this. And if you think about it, if you have a, a swarm of these drones doing that, you could have 20 or 40 of them doing your whole field every week and, and a fraction of the cost you'd pay someone to do this in a large plane with that, with less refuels and everything else. As long as you've mastered some of those issues. As long uh, as someone has. I don't think the <laughs> farmer is going to have to program this. And, and a lot of what we focus on this project is um, having the farmer just be able to select a region they want the, the swarm mm -hmm. of drones to operate in and then have that swarm do something intelligent to accomplish so the, the mission that we aspect. want. that's the economy aspect. Absolutely. You want the drones to be able to make some of those smart decisions about how they're going to operate within that region, for example. Absolutely, and it's a big leap from our current state of the art in that uh, the way we currently control any kind of swarm or group of, of entities is to select them individually and make them do something. And so if you can imagine a farmer trying to tell 20 drones what they would like to do with their crop, um, they would select individual waypoints along the edge of their farm, and they would, they would do each row individually like this. And um, that can be a lot of time. And, and if they mess something up, who knows what that might mean. It might mean the loss of a crop. It could be various other things. What would be nicer is if you could, you could actually code in the intelligence for what the farmer wants, and all they have to do is select a region and say go. And that's the kind of thing we're kind of looking for to help out, whether it's search and rescue uh, people, uh, cr ground crews, mm -hmm. for them to be able to say, we know that buildings are in these locations. We think human survivors might be there. 
Um, drones, do what you do. You know, see if you can find someone with your thermal cameras, with your regular cameras. Let me know if you find something interesting and report it back to me, and I will decide if I should send more people over to help out there and see if there are people under the rubble, for instance. So the communication aspect of this is critical. And mm -hmm. so that leads us to uh, some of the work that you're doing on throwable wireless access points. Ah, yeah. Why don't you talk a little bit about that and, and how does that contribute to this whole emerging area of autonomy? Absolutely. Well, one of the things about drones that you find, especially for electrically powered drones, is they have a very short uptime. They have a very short flight time. Uh, 20 minutes, sometimes there's less, uh, like 10 minutes. And it depends on how many sensors and how much CPU and how much battery drain you really have on the drone. And so we realized pretty quickly that if you want to support an infrastructure, a wireless infrastructure, or a new communication medium between uh, groups in the field, like for instance, if you've had an earthquake and all the cell towers are down and all the, the telephone, uh, telecommunication lines are down, you may actually need something in place quickly, rapidly, that can actually support an infrastructure for communication. And so we think that these wireless throwable thermal and acoustic uh, sensors that have built-in wireless access points uh, for, for ad hoc mode um, that they can actually form their own infrastructure and allow you to send messages, whether it's video, whether it's voice over IP, um, whether it's um, just simple radio chat. Um, it could also be instant messaging um, to be able to communicate between these to say that we found someone over here, we need five more people or whatever. It could be important messages. It could also just be uh, possible locations they should look at, so pictures that are disseminated among the group. Um, now, this has a lot of different uses. This could be used in search and rescue, obviously, is our main kind of focus. But um, squads and militaries would also use this for establishing a perimeter around themselves. You could use these for establishing a perimeter around a building. So like uh, we're, we've been talking with Department of Homeland Security and Department of Energy, uh, trying to find some grants for that kind of work where we're looking at um, not only sensing people, but also maybe sensing other drones. So uh, the thing about opening the airspace in 2015 is that we not only open ourselves up to people using it for surveillance, um, uh, uh, various things like law enforcement or whatever, but um, we live in a post-9-11 world. We also have to consider that people will use this inexp inexpensive technology to target us, um, whether it's for reconning a potential target, uh, like the, you know, the Boston Marathon or something like that, or, or whatever, and we really should have some measures for defending ourselves. Um, and so uh, we're looking at various aspects into that, and that's some of the things that we might talk about later. Um, but now, the, these, this kind of communication, uh, I'll take your example of the earthquake where we've got the cell towers and everything down. Mm -hmm. Lots of different people are going to need communications resources. There's going to be a lot of data that comes at this. I, I'm imagining this sort of un, fairly underpowered in comparison mm -hmm. to a normal cell tower yeah. wireless network. So how do you deal with filtering out and how do you deal with the volumes of data? Is it just more access points, more throwables, or do you have strategies for kind of dealing with the, um, the data volumes and filtering that's going to be needed to be able to make this a useful uh, resource in, an, in a in a limited infrastructure? Well, I won't, I won't claim that our project goes to solve all those problems. We, in, in the Advanced Mobile Systems Initiative uh, that Edwin, Edwin Morris runs, we really have a lot of different technologies that are really aimed at tackling the tactile edge problems. And so um, the Wi-Fi ad hoc mode kind of networks really only support hundreds to maybe thousands of devices. You really can't scale it much more than that. Um, so if you, if you do have a situation where you're trying to support millions of people, like for instance in a displaced kind of way, a, a major city is hit like New York or something, you know, you're going to have blackouts just as well as sure. the cell towers. Um, uh, but you might be able to use other technologies. We have AMS, um, like the cloudlets, like other kinds of forward provisioned elements that would be able to, uh, you'd have Wi-Fi ad hoc kind of networks that are connected through wired connections, and that way you can scale up mm -hmm. the number of devices you support without actually everybody being on the Wi-Fi ad hoc mode kind of thing. Um, so uh, one of the things we do in the project, though, to try to do this is uh, to, to support the volume that we think is going to be in this is that we try to operate in reduced information modes that maximize the utility of the bandwidth that we have available. So we, uh, like for on the, on the quadcopters we're using, we have a control plane and a data plane. And what I mean by those are they're just radios. They're broadcast radios. Um, the control plane is really, it has a very long distance that it can communicate over, but it has a very low bandwidth. Um, and that's just kind of the trade-off you take sure. with radios. Um, 
So we try to use that medium for the, the, the collaboration between the quadcopters to be able to say, I'm going to go to this location. This is what I've, maybe I've found someone over here. This is who you should look at, um, something like that. Uh, and then we have the data plane, which is the high bandwidth but short range Wi-Fi right. access point. And those are more for transferring video or images or thermal images or audio or whatever else you might need that needs that kind of megabits per second kind of connection. And so um, we try to make smart decisions about what we send. Uh, by default, for instance, if we find a person at a location, we'll only send the metadata that locates that there's a GPS ping at this location, for instance, uh, that has a, a, a likely person there, like with a certain probability mm -hmm. attached, that you're going to find a person at this location, or maybe you might find 20. Um, there might be you know, right. a building that you're at that has a lot of people that were there and need help. And so uh, we try to send that data, and then the user would request a, 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 a higher feed from that location. They would try to set up a network bridge back with throwables or with more drones. The drones can form their own network bridge between each other, and that would dictate um, the, the bandwidth available to back to the so person. So you're using the control plane as a filter to try and minimize the number of places that you've got to have the high bandwidth access. I think that's a fair way to characterize it. Um, we do have other kinds of filters on there that would... Um, so, I mean, filter is a, an overused sure. word, really, yeah, yeah. In, our, in, our, in our field. Uh, but we try to do a lot of filtering on it to make sure that we're utilizing the bandwidth as best we can. So um, that's a way that you're trying to maximize the resource, and that's actually part of the parallel aspect of all this. Absolutely, so. absolutely. This is very cool stuff. Um, yeah. I think our listeners are, are, uh, should be very interested in this research. Um, and I also understand that this research naturally involves several collaborations. Do you want to tell us a little bit about bit about the people that are collaborating with you on this project? Absolutely. I think we have some, some of the top minds in the field really working on the electrical and computing engineering, especially aspects of this. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Mai um, and his graduate student, Tom Jackson, from the EC department, uh, that's electrical and computer engineering department at Carnegie Mellon. They're working on that throwable thermal and acoustic sensor with the access point built into it. Um, right now we're coming up with the first prototype, so I, I don't know if throwable might be the right, right word for it. Rollable maybe or placeable uh, for the first prototype. We're, not, we're trying to be ginger with it. Um, how big, do you know how big they're talking it, Right about? now it's about at the size of a softball, but um, you know, that's just the first generation. It'll come down in mm -hmm. size. They're actually doing most of the, the hard skinning of it by hand rather than fabricated, so that's going to be a lot be bigger. A, bigger, a, lot, yeah. a lot bigger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, Kenneth Mai and, and, and Tom Jackson are working on that. And then uh, we're also working with Anthony Rowe and, and several students on a project called Drone RK, which is an open source middleware uh, designed for the Parrot Aero Drone 2.0, which is a, is a very popular mass-produced quadcopter. It's like $300. You can buy it on Amazon. And so um, we want to stay, stay in a price point that supports search and rescuers. So right. like uh, one, of the, one of the hardest things to do is to find a platform that does everything you need to do at a price that people can afford that right. would be using this. So if you know if you're talking about a fire department who has all volunteer fire department, you know, you know, their monthly, their their yearly, you know, thing here cannot be buying fourteen, fifty thousand uh, right. dollar quadcopters right. or whatever. Um, and there are those from Lockheed Martin and various other places make some very robust um, quadcopters and and fixed wing airplanes that'd be able to support these guys, but they're very expensive and, and fire departments can't afford that. Uh, wilderness departments, you know, emergency management services, various other people, they can't afford these kind of price points. So we are trying to keep it um, within the footprint we think people can afford. And um, that causes a lot of problems with development. And so um, Anthony Rowe, is, he's working on the, the side of trying to make these commercially mass-produced, inexpensive drones work in a way that can be useful in a swarm. And so adding GPS, adding thermal sensors onto the drone, um, various other things like that to, to make it so that it'll actually accomplish the mission tasks that you want them to do. And so, um, yeah, we've got several students. We have uh, interns right now from Vanderbilt University and also from Carnegie Mellon. Um, there's five different students working right now in the summer. And then we'll have um, PhD students and master's students also coming in in the, in the fall uh, to continue the project. So, so there's a lot of good different stuff ideas there. coming into this. Absolutely. And, and we've, um, th this is, like you said, we, uh, we think this is a very interesting project. We think that a lot of people have, have responded very well to it. Um, we have had interest from Tim Voss uh, from Lawrence Livermore um, National Labs to work on a security aspect of this where you really don't want people to have unauthorized access to send whatever commands you want. So, you know, if mm -hmm. you, even if for like a farmer, he doesn't want his next door neighbor to, for instance, take control of the swarm and, and water his own crops or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Um, that would be bad. So uh, Tim Boss, he has a lot of experience, and his team has a lot of experience over there at the Hops Laboratory. 
uh, with security layers and, and authentication schemes and things of nature to um, that we think might be able to integrate into this swarm idea and have uh, a semblance of security. Um, we also have ideas for like, um, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things. There's uh, there's a, a moving target software defense kind of layer that, that has it so that the swarm, uh, one of the things we have planned for 2014 to investigate is that the swarm dynamically responds to what it believes are intrusions. And so it might change the complete algorithm and what variables it's looking at between the swarm and various other things to accomplish the same mission task, but in a different way that can't be predicted as easily. And then change that frequently so that they can't uh, anticipate it. And we think sort that's going like to be Sort of like changing important. your route from home to work to be more safe. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you think of it like that, on your way home, you might take the bus one day, you might take a car, you might walk, you might do whatever, and you might take a different path with each one of those. And so try to strategize those different ways of going home and, um, and make it unpredictable. Uh, and this can be done with cryptography. This can be do, uh, done with a lot of different ways. But at the core of it, you really have to have a flexible way of programming the drones that can understand that it needs to accomplish a mission task and it doesn't necessarily matter which one it uses. Um, there are certainly more efficient ways to do certain things, but it might be able to change right. this and be able to the actually do... The most efficient do... isn't always the safest. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um, the middleware we're developing on this project for real-time artificial intelligence is actually available as open source, as are the area coverage algorithms and the network bridging algorithms that we're implementing in the Madara system. And we'll include lists of some of those links on the transcript for this podcast. Well, James, this work, I think, does promise some amazing breakthroughs, both in the use of autonomy, in partial autonomy with human in the loop, as well as ad hoc mobile communications. And um, I look forward to seeing how this work evolves. Uh, we'll, we'll probably have you back in a little while, maybe next year, see what's going on with the Lawrence Livermore uh, you know, project. Mm -hmm. But I really want to thank you for joining us today. This was very exciting work. Thanks, Suzanne. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. If you would like more information on James's work on autonomous systems and ad hoc mobile communications, you can check out his blog post. Just go to blog.sei.cmu.edu. In the right-hand column, click on James's name, James Edmondson, or the Artificial Intelligence tag. For more information on the research James's team is doing in pervasive mobile computing, please see their Our Work site at sei.cmu.edu slash mobile computing slash research slash index.cfm. This podcast is available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcast and on Carnegie Mellon University's iTunes U site. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you. <laughs>